All right, hello and welcome. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here at this terrific and terrifically important symposium and for making it all the way to the end. Uh, we saved the biggest and the best for last, so <laughs> um, uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. <laughs> Before we dive into the topic, so the topic of this panel is 150 and beyond, debating the 14th Amendment today. And we're going to be looking at some of the more contemporary issues relating to how the amendment is interpreted um, by the courts today. Before we get into the discussion, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, sitting to my left is Randy Barnett. He is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at Georgetown Law and the director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. His books include Restoring the Lost Constitution, The Presumption of Liberty, The Structure of Liberty, Justice and the Rule of Law. And his latest book is Our Republican Constitution, Securing the Liberty and Sovereignty of We the People. Janae Nelson, uh, next to Randy, uh, is the associate director counsel of the NAACP LDF, and she's former director of LDF's political participation, participation group and a former NAACP LDF Freed Frank Fellow. Prior to rejoining the NAACP, she served as Associate Dean at St. John's University School of Law, where she was also a full professor of law, and her scholarship and research centers on domestic and comparative election law, race, and domestic theory. Sitting next to Janae is uh, Garrett Epps. He is professor at the University of Baltimore Law School and a contributing writer to The Atlantic Online, and he serves as their Supreme Court correspondent. He is also a contributing editor of The American Prospect, and he's the author of Democracy Reborn, The 14th Amendment and the Fight for Equal Rights in Post-Civil War America, and the author of two great novels that you can find on Amazon. <laughs> uh, next to Garrett is Kimberly West Falcon, who's professor of law and James P. Bradley Chair in Constitutional Law at Loyola Law School. She was a Skadden Fellow in the New York office of the NAACP LDF in 1996, and she went on to direct the Los Angeles office of LDF until 2005 as the Western Regional Director, Count, Regional Council and Director. And she's the author of numerous articles on intelligence and fair and proper use of standardized tests, anti-discrimination and constitutional law. Finally, we have Earl Maltz, who is distinguished professor at Rutgers Law School, the author of Rethinking Constitutional Law, Originalism, Interventionism and the Politics of Judicial Review and the author of Civil Rights, the Constitution, and Congress, 1863 to 1865. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. <laughs> All right, so I'll just start us off with a very uh, general question, and you can feel free to uh, respond uh, as you like. Um, so let's start with uh, Randy, to my left. And so Randy, can you briefly summarize the importance of the 14th Amendment in constitutional law today? And in discussing this importance, can you um, tell us a little bit about whether you think, have the modern interpretations of the amendment captured its full scope and potential application? Is there more to be done? Or have courts gone too far in applying the amendment? And what's the appropriate judicial role in interpreting the amendment? Well, thanks. Um, and thanks for having me here. It's great to be back at the Constitution Center, which is a, a wonderful resource for Philadelphia and the country. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, in the last panel you heard, one of the panels, I think it was Eric Foner say, that the courts uh, significantly messed up uh, the 14th Amendment in the immediate aftermath of its enactment, uh, and they've never admitted their mistake. Uh, and I think that's right. So uh, uh, they haven't admitted their mistake. They have sort of a, a rectified it partially by misinterpreting other provisions. So for example, by eliminating the Privileges or Immunities Clause, they've rectified it partially by misinterpreting the Due Process Clause. Um, uh, and so they, we, ha we are getting results that tend to be consistent with the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, but I, I, they, they have, I think the Supreme Court should really own up to its mistake and, and, and start enforcing the entire Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, which should include the Citizenship Clause and the Privileges or Immunities Clause as well. And if they were to do that, uh, the 14th Amendment would apply beyond uh, the scope of where the courts are currently taking it. For example, uh, you have um, 
uh, the right to pursue a lawful occupation, which was a right that the Supreme Court denied existed in the slaughterhouse cases. And I want to remind everybody that the next day after the slaughterhouse cases was decided, they decided the Bradwell versus Illinois case, which denied uh, a woman the right to practice law in Illinois. And what they said the day after slaughterhouse is, we don't even have to get into whether this was a reasonable exercise of police power, which they did talk about in slaughterhouse, because we decided yesterday that there is no right to pursue a lawful occupation. Therefore, we don't even need to provide a reason. Uh, for why women should not be allowed to practice law. The dissenters in Slaughterhouse had to explain why it was reasonable, and then you had this misogynist opinion by Justice Bradley trying to justify the discrimination. Um, but there's an example of uh, a law, uh, of a right, uh, the right to pursue a lawful occupation, that if it were enforced today as a fundamental right, would, for example, say that uh, uh, African hair braiders don't need uh, uh, beautician's license or cosmetology licenses, which takes them thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours of study, sometimes more study than it takes to be an airplane pilot, just so that they can braid hair. That is a right that is not recognized by the Supreme Court. It is recognized by some states. Uh, and that's just the beginning of what we would get if we, redid the, if we started enforcing the, Constitu the 14th Amendment according to its original meaning. Uh, so Janae, same question to you, and feel free to comment on anything that Randy just said. Sure, uh, I, I couldn't agree more that the courts got it wrong from the beginning. Uh, the only amendment I'd make to what Randy said is that the court continues to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, that we see a number of cases in which the court has an opportunity to interpret the 14th Amendment in its full breadth and, and doesn't do so. Um, and we are burdened by these decisions, by decisions like McCleskey versus Kemp, uh, in terms of how we prove discrimination and, and uh, uh, jettisoning the, the importance of statistical evidence, even when it's buttressed by a history of discrimination and there's a context that uh, makes it uh, powerful, powerful evidence of discrimination. Washington versus Davis is another example uh, where the court limited the scope of the 14th Amendment to focus so narrowly on intent. And uh, we all know that uh, to, to interpret such a powerful and meaningful provision of the Constitution based on a whodunit theory. Like, you know, can we point to someone who, or some actor who intends to discriminate? It's such a limiting way of interpreting the breadth of that amendment, and particularly when we think about the Equal Protection Clause um, and, and how we've turned that into looking almost solely at application, not really the full breadth of what it means to protect citizens on an equal basis. That project of equal citizenship is one that barely got off the ground before the court began to thwart it with the cases that, that Randy mentioned and that some mentioned on the earlier panels. Um, and I guess I'll just say one more thing just to, to build on what Randy said about the fundamental rights that are uh, enshrined at least by the court, in the court's mind, in the 14th Amendment. Having that, that binary of fundamental rights and classifications is so under-inclusive. It leaves out many classifications that are worthy of protection, like disability, like wealth, other ways in which inequality is perpetuated. Um, and again, the fundamental rights do not cover a right to education. They not cover really basic rights that I think we would all think are fundamental to a healthy democracy and to citizenship. So it's woefully under-inclusive, and uh, I hope we can explore some of the opportunities to expand its breadth. Well, I certainly think the courts are far afield from, from the meaning of the 14th Amendment, and uh, am I not on? Now you are. Ah, now I'm on, okay. Um, and I think that the, the striking thing, it's, it's not just courts, it's, it's our culture, is that in, in America we have constitutionalism and we, we have very strong belief uh, in the idea of a constitution, but we see the constitution as something that was created not far from here in 1787 and with a few little uh, outbuildings that have been added uh, over the years. And in fact, if uh, my view of American constitutionalism, the proper view is that the 14th Amendment is at the center of it, that the, this, this really was the second founding, and not only that, it was the correct founding, the first one having been uh, seriously flawed, and that, that a proper sense of constitutionalism would regard the framers of the 14th Amendment uh, you know, on a par with uh, the people we revere for their roles in, in Philadelphia. 
uh, and would take note of the fact that the 14th Amendment is the first time the word equal appears in the Constitution as a human concept. Prior to that, it was, you know, states shall be equal in this way or that. Uh, and, and for that reason, I think that the 14th Amendment can and should be read as a whole as having a very specific content. Uh, and that content is that we are to remake this country, which was almost destroyed by one thing, which was the ability of oligarchic, slave-owning state uh, societies in the states to exercise control over the national government. This is what was called the slave power before the Civil War. And that the 14th Amendment is there to ensure that we remain what Carl Schurz called a union of truly democratic states, that if the states are democratic, if the states uh, allow participatory democracy, then the union will be all right. And instead, the court's constantly tiptoeing around vote suppression by the states, by felon disenfranchisement uh, by the states, by various forms in which local uh, elites within the states maintain oligarchical positions, and, and we are troubled by precisely the same issues. So. Uh, I would like to see the courts, I mean, they could start by reading my book, it's all in there, but, <laughs> but, but, but I'd like to see this, the courts do more with the sense of the Constitution as being uh, formed by the 14th Amendment. Well, first I'd like to say um, how appreciative I am of the opportunity to, uh, to be at the National Constitution Center uh, to, to think about uh, the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment. Um, I um, teach constitutional law on a regular basis, but to think about the 150 years with the amendment holistically is, is really a treat. Um, it's a treat that when, that when I'm done with that process, uh, the Supreme Court is not wearing a white hat. Um, Congress is wearing a white hat for having ratified the amendment, uh, but, but sadly, uh, much as my constitutional law class uh, usually um, develops to, um, to make clear, uh, if there's a villain in the story of, um, of what went wrong with the 14th Amendment, um, it's very much the Supreme Court. And you've heard uh, from prior panels, um, some of that can be laid at the feet of the court interpreting the Privileges and Immunities Clause as a nullity, um, with which um, I think there is room to critique I think there's also um, substantial room to critique uh, the court's failure to interpret the citizenship clause in the way uh, that um, Justice John Marshall Harlan um, advocated for in his dissents in the civil rights cases. So not 15 years after the ratification of the 14th Amendment, there was a viable interpretation of it that really fit with where the last panel left off, an interpretation that was true to Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, uh, that Congress had some enforcement power that was substantial. And so I don't think we have to go very far past uh, that 15-year period. Um, uh, Cheryl and Eiffel already made this point in the context of the civil rights cases that the Supreme Court played a very critical role um, in um, interpreting uh, the, um, the, the 14th Amendment and the Citizenship Clause um, in a very narrow way. And I think it made that almost a nullity. While it certainly did um, overturn Dred Scott, uh, using uh, the civil rights cases as an opportunity to strike down a Civil Rights Act uh, that hasn't come up so far. There's been talk of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, but the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was a basic public accommodations act, um, an act that um, would give um, African Americans um, and other people of color access to opera and theaters um, and to hotels. Um, and so um, it's little known, um, at least among some of my law students, um, that uh, the second reconstruction and uh, the public accommodation statute of 1964 had a precursor uh, that was almost identical, uh, that African Americans uh, were responsible for um, exercising uh, their full citizenship rights uh, by riding rail cars, um, by again uh, going to hotels and theaters, um, and, uh, and that the Supreme Court of the United States uh, struck down that law and said it was outside the scope of Congress's um, power under the 14th Amendment, um, at least from the perspective of a constitutional law prof professor is to me um, how the Supreme Court played a very critical role in ending at least uh, what the 14th Amendment's promise was with respect to the Constitution. Um, so, so I would say, um, sadly, uh, that the importance of the 14th Amendment has really been um, for the vast majority of its time and with those provisions except the Due Process Clause uh, 
Um, I would say it's been um, an amendment uh, that is operated to reinforce existing power structures um, and that um, we uh, see that with what we've already talked about with respect to the Privileges and Immunities Clause and uh, the Citizenship Clause. Uh, the Due Process Clause, when I look at the 150 years, um, I see what maybe folks would want to see on, on a day of thinking about commemoration. Uh, you see a provision uh, that while we have the Lochner era that we demonize in con law, um, where the wealthy and the powerful were benefiting from the due process clause, uh, there is since 1937 a story of um, greater liberty coming from the due process clause with high points like Griswold versus Connecticut, Roe v. Wade, um, and now Obergefell versus Hodges. Uh, that's the trajectory where the Supreme Court gets to wear the white hat, and I want to give it its due with respect to the due process clause. With the Equal Protection Clause, however, um, my, um, my look back at the 150 years, I'm fond of doing um, arithmetic at best and sometimes statistics at most. Um, I'm that law professor who loves numbers. Um, I came up with only about 19 years of the Equal Protection Clause protecting people of color and protecting the disenfranchised um, in a way that was had a practical significance. Uh, so that leaves um, uh, all the rest of the 150 years. Uh, the first 86 uh, we were, were years of really treating the Equal Protection Clause as dead letter um, after striking down the Civil Rights Act of 1875 um, and saying that uh, states have the power uh, to protect uh, people of color from discrimination, uh, then um, proceeding in Plessy versus Ferguson to say that too is consistent with the Equal Protection Clause. So that's a horrible start with 86 years. Um, and then I think 1976 is when I see the Supreme Court ending uh, the second Reconstruction and much more subtly, uh, but through cases as Janae mentioned, uh, Washington versus Davis, San Antonio versus Rodriguez, rejecting uh, the, um, the fundamental right to education as a claim, rejecting uh, protection of people on the basis of socioeconomic status. Um, and since then, an equal protection clause uh, that has virtually almost exclusively, I have a hard time, I don't teach my con law students any cases, any modern cases, uh, that um, are people of color making claims on an equal protection clause, sadly except uh, Korematsu, which is Fred Korematsu challenging his internment and losing. Uh, and then after that, it is um, rejected white plaintiff after rejected white plaintiff challenging race-based affirmative action um, and being treated uh, with the utmost um, uh, deference and receiving the court's highest level of scrutiny under the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, so um, again, I, I'm, I'm very honored to be here and it's a wonderful chance to, um, to really think about uh, this momentous uh, day, but um, again, I think uh, it's, a, it's a spotty mixed bag with the different provisions of the 14th Amendment. I'm also honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I actually have a very different perspective than all of these panelists. That my, I begin with the view that uh, the country would be better off if there were no judicial review at all. And then uh, that having been said, I think that given that the Congress and the people who ratified the 14th, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment had a legitimate authority to do that, that uh, I have to give some, I would give a strong, uh, a strong deference to other, the decisions of other branches of government, even, even under those. And uh, when I say that I don't think the country, would, that I think the country would be better off if there were no judicial review at all, I'm not saying that all of the decisions made striking down laws were bad or, and some of them were very important, but I think that there's no reason, for the reason, partially for the reasons you talked about, there's no reason to believe either in theory or in practice that in the long run that we are better off because of having judicial review. So that makes me talk about a couple of other cases, two of which you described. Uh, Obergefell, now I have to think about precedent. And now I have to think about Obergefell and I have to think about parents involved, which is the, uh, perhaps this, the most draconian affirmative action decision the Supreme Court has handed down. I don't have a theory of precedent, a, a developed theory of precedent like I know Randy does. I have a, uh, I sort of on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, just to say that my view of Obergefell would be uh, not talking about the, the uh, policy merits of the decision, that uh, I think that Obergefell should not be overruled because uh, it would create chaos and there's been substantial reliance on this from people who were, uh, uh, who've got married under the rule established by Obergefell. And on the other hand, I think parents involved should be overruled just because I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be overruled. 
that uh, that that, there, that nobody has nobody has relied upon it, and I think it's just a bad idea. And just to reinforce the last point about judicial review, I want to point about cases that not only the last panel but this panel has talked about. I want to talk about not only parents involved. I want to think about Crookshank, think about uh, the civil rights cases, and most recently think about Shelby County, the case which essentially uh, uh, got rid of the preclearance requirement of the uh, Voting Rights Act. So uh, that's all I got to say. Okay. Thanks. Not controversial. <laughs> Great. Well, there's a number of topics on the table, um, and so. Maybe I'll just pick up with uh, Earl where you left off. And, and so, Randy, do you have anything to add to what Earl said about judicial review, maybe the court's approach to interpreting the amendment, but then also relating to what Janae said about the under-inclusiveness of the uh, uh, equal protection jurisprudence? Uh, do you think that uh, Justice Kennedy was sort of on the right track in Obergefell? Or uh, is um, what do you make of the rigid um, uh, uh, classification that the court has used uh, up until this point. Um, yeah. Well, I uh, strongly disagree with my friend Earl uh, about the value of judicial review. Um, although, in fact, in the, at the founding, it wasn't called judicial review. The term judicial review is a 20th century term uh, unknown. Before the 20th century, it was considered to be, as Philip Hamburger has shown in his book, a judicial duty, a judicial duty to follow the law. And in this case, uh, you if a law, uh, a higher law, is in conflict with a subordinate law, then you follow the higher law. The higher law is the Constitution. The lower law is a statute. If there's a conflict between the two, as Alexander Hamilton explained in Federalist 78, you follow, and I guess there's an exhibit to ha Hamilton here now, so I can invoke Hamilton uh, here in these sanctified uh, quarters. Um, you follow the higher law, which is the Constitution. The judges have a duty to do that. Um, and I think it's salutary when they do. Most of the failures, uh, Earl has come up with a couple of counterexamples, but most of the failures of the court uh, uh, have been in the failure. It's failure to invalidate laws, not its invalidation of laws. Although I do agree the invalidation of the Civil Rights Law uh, Act of 1875 was horrible, an egregious, uh, an egregious act by the court. Most of the examples of judicial failure are a judicial failure to uh, enforce the Constitution against either the states or the federal government. So on that, um, I part company. I don't necessarily think uh, that the scope of judicial review is as great as others may do. I think there's room for disagreement amongst the branches about, I don't think the Supreme Court is the ultimate um, uh, determiner of what the meaning of the Constitution is. They may, it is the ultimate decider in a particular case, that's for sure but not in the long run. The Dred Scott case tells us that. This, just because the Supreme Court says it so doesn't make it so, and that gets us back to the issue of precedent. Um, uh, I don't necessarily have a fancy theory of precedent. I just don't think the opinions of judges trump the, right, the, the Constitution, and, and it particularly isn't true for long dead justices. They don't trump the Constitution either, and if there's a clear conflict, between what the Constitution stipulates and what the Supreme Court has said, then the Constitution must govern over the Supreme Court just as it does uh, over a statute. But last thing I'll say is that every officer, everybody who takes an oath, uh, has a duty to enforce the Constitution. Uh, Congress should not pass a law it believes to be unconstitutional, regardless of if it, whether it'll be upheld by the Supreme Court. The President should not sign a law that he believes or she believes is unconstitutional, regardless of if, if whether it will be upheld by the court. And finally then, only if those two bodies say, okay, we're gonna think, we're gonna sign, we're gonna pass the law, we're gonna sign the law, we're gonna override the veto, only then does the court get a say, as the third branch of government and all three branches ought to agree that a measure is constitutional before we should consider it constitutional. Uh, so I'm, I'm reminded of um, something that, that Thurgood Marshall said, uh, who's the founder of the Legal Defense Fund, about the role of the judiciary in interpreting the Constitution, and that is the judiciary is there to protect those who other institutions leave unprotected. Um, we haven't seen that, and you point out, uh, Earl pointed out a number of decisions that are problematic, and we've all expressed our concerns, Shelby County being one of them, uh, but I don't think we can pick and choose uh, when we want judicial, judicial review and when we don't. Um, the courts have played an instrumental role in shaping 
the 14th Amendment in problematic ways, but also in animating certain principles. So I do want to be clear that this is not you know, a complete um, and total disaster. I think we see ways in which um, the court has responded, um, not as forcefully as we would like, but obviously Brown versus Board of Education, the court advanced uh, an equality principle in this country that, that left to its own devices, it never would have come to, at, certainly not at that period of time. Uh, and even though it did not do it as forcefully and as fully and as, in, in a, as full-throated a way as we would have liked, um, the court played an instrumental role in changing uh, norms and principles and, and really sussing out that doctrine to some extent. Um, the court just hasn't gone far enough and it has made many missteps and uh, taken us in directions that, um, uh, that really haven't been uh, uh, loyal to, I think, the spirit of the Constitution or the spirit of the 14th Amendment in particular. Uh, but judicial review, and particularly I want to focus on this idea of judicial activism because that, that's a term that gets thrown back and forth depending on you know, um, uh, how you view yourself ideologically. Uh, the court, judicial review is problematic when there is judicial activism in the true sense of the word where the court is reaching beyond, and this is I guess to some extent what Randy is saying, beyond its authority and, and uh, interpreting the Constitution in ways that are not justified by either the letter or the spirit of the document. Um, and that has happened in, in a great many ways, and I think we can talk about some of the more problematic cases where that's manifested. Um, but judicial review should not be uh, something that we, uh, we can talk about the limits of it and the scope of it, uh, but it's something that has been a protective force in many ways, and, and something that I think we uh, should, should speak to with some respect. I smile because I have an article coming out called The Letter and the Spirit, oh, uh, so just, which is a theory of interpretation and construction. It's coming out in the Georgetown Law Journal, so that, I, that made me happy. You can cite me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess my take is that I, I really don't think whether we should have judicial review or not is a genuine normative question in front of the House. It's The system as we have it today wouldn't operate uh, without uh, a robust system of judicial review, and we can debate about whether any individual instance of it uh, was warranted or not. But I want to speak up for one of the neglected sections of the 14th Amendment that I think uh, doesn't get the attention it deserves, and that's Section 5, which in which the, the framers explicitly empowered Congress. There's not a word in the 14th Amendment about the courts, and in fact, there's every reason to believe the framers really didn't trust the courts, whose most recent product had been Dred Scott. Uh, and if you look at Congress's uh, performance under, over the years as an enforcer of the 14th Amendment, it's got some, some really good points to its credit, beginning with the Civil Rights Act of 1875, coming forward to the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, um, you know, the Violence Against Women Act, uh, and what we see the court doing over and over is stepping in to sort of say, no, no, this 14th Amendment nonsense mustn't be carried too far. Uh, because really, uh, this is really matters for the states. So, uh, you know, f if you had to choose one or the other, you might choose Congress. Um, uh, if, but whether or not, I think people thinking in terms of the 14th Amendment's importance in our system need to recognize that a robust role for Congress in considering and debating the protection of rights was really very much part of the text and the structure and the debates, uh, and we are shortchanging that uh, ever so slightly because the, the court has stepped in so readily uh, in order to decide what the 14th Amendment means. I'm, I'm going to situate myself as, uh, I guess, a traditionalist um, compared to uh, the, um, the, the, the claim of uh, eliminating judicial review um, and uh, the um, being on a panel with um, I think at least two originalists. Uh, I'm not going to miss the opportunity to engage on that front. Um, so the traditionalist in me would say uh, that uh, the argument in favor of judicial review is just the, the basic separation of powers need to have a check 
on the other branches of government um, and, um, and that the whole point of the, the exercise is uh, we can't allow tyranny for many of those branches. So, um, so, so that leaves me with a court that I have said is, um, is wearing a black hat for most of the time. Uh, and um, if I'm not willing, um, or at least not yet persuaded, uh, that originalism uh, should um, unearth or unseat uh, the, cur the court's current uh, common law precedent-based approach, the, current, the court's um, assertion that it abides by principles of stare decisis, uh, then I have no choice but to um, ask that the court abide by that consistently. Um, and so uh, that's a very traditional critique, but um, one that I think is of value um, in light of what I'm saying about uh, the, um, the trajectory of the, the 14th Amendment. Um, again, I think um, over time, and um, I think we are at a high watermark for the due process clause, um, I think that's again what uh, the court's uh, striking down of same-sex marriage laws uh, means. Um, it's arguably um, a high watermark uh, for power for the court. Um, I would concede uh, that um, it, there's a lot of discretion that the Supreme Court now has in interpreting uh, what's um, protected under the Due Process Clause, uh, but specifically with respect to the Equal Protection Clause, um, what I, I would present um, as a, a notion of how a traditionalist uh, could still um, reach the conclusions I reach um, is that the slaughterhouse cases, uh, which have been invoked in the context of talking about the Privileges and Immunities Clause, um, are al also extremely important for um, a first interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause. And one uh, that is consistent with uh, using the specific intent of the framers of the 14th Amendment as a source of constitutional interpretation, uh, but then I don't have to next um, become an originalist uh, to just say we can still um, use a, a common law precedent-based approach um, and still have some interest in uh, what uh, the, the framers um, of that amendment meant, but also that first interpretation in the slaughterhouse cases. Um, and I actually, so I wouldn't, um, I, I, what, what the court said in the slaughterhouse cases among saying that um, people who had been enslaved should be free, it said the protection of the newly freedmen and citizen from the oppressions of those who had formerly exercised unlimited dominion over them. That interpretation seems absolutely positively solid, and it's the earliest and first interpretation of the meaning of the 14th Amendment. Um, what is tragically wrong is that uh, the court um, rejected that several, not too long after in 1883 when it struck down the Civil Rights Act of 1875. So all we need um, to correct the court's interpretation of the <coughs> protection clause is for it to return to its earliest interpretation um, and, um, and not to say that uh, we couldn't and continue to have a broad interpretation of equal protection that protects um, pe women, um, protects sexual um, orientation minorities um, and gender identity minorities. But um, what is truly perverse is that um, there is binding um, precedent where the Supreme Court first interpreted the Equal Protection Clause, again, to protect um, people of African descent um, from the oppressions of those who had formerly exercised unlimited dominion of, over them. And, um, and that's not what we see in the current Supreme Court at all. Uh, that instead you have a Supreme Court that starting with those 1970s cases um, has said uh, that um, the idea of protecting discrete and insular minorities is not our business anymore. Um, Justice Scalia said that in a concurring opinion in Schuette, uh that um, he looks at uh, Caroline Product's famous footnote four um, as dictum uh, that, um, that, that he can really dismiss. And so um, what I think is tragic is that even within its traditional framework, uh, the court has a very um, easy and direct approach to interpreting um, the Constitution and the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, in a particular way that would be very common sense um, and, uh, and that would be consistent with its own first interpretation uh, that, um, that, I, that I frankly think it is opting not to adopt because the court is not um, applying um, its own doctrine, um, it's not being consistent in its own theory, um, and I think it's letting its own ideological positions on um, these issues of modern importance uh, really seep into how they're interpreting that, the Equal Protection Clause in particular. 30 seconds. Uh, if I could be sure that the nine justices on the court would somehow be uh, sympathetic to my ideological perspectives, I would be all in favor of judicial review. However, I want to tell you about two things. Our first, we have what our current system is, which is 
whatever four smart justices and Justice Kennedy agree is what the law is, is what the law is. And second, if for my progressive friends in the panel and out there in the audience, I would suggest that you root very hard that for Democrats to get to 51 in the Senate because otherwise, in the words of George R.R. R. Martin, who was my classmate, winter is coming. Because uh, if, if, there are, if there are three more years of, uh, of uh, Republican dominance in the, in the uh, White House and in the Senate, it's very unlikely that there's not going to be, particularly in view of the, I mean, there's a long rap about what's happened to judicial selection as well, but partition in view of what judicial selection is, it's not going to matter what 400 members of the House of Representatives think. So that's why I'm just not in favor of judicial review, generally. And in, at the very least, as I say, I, as an originalist, I have to believe in uh, that original meaning matters and should be enforced. But there's a question of presumption. And I would have strong presumption in favor of constitutionality. That's all I have to say. OK. Um. So we have an audience question that asks, what role, if any, does the 14th Amendment play in issues of economic inequality going forward? So maybe Janae, I'll pose that to you first. What role does it currently play? Could it, could it play, what, I what guess. What role could it play? <laughs> um, I think it could play an incredibly uh, robust role um, if we mm -hmm. considered wealth and class as uh, you know, one of the protected classes, or at least factored that into the analysis. We had an opportunity, and in fact, the court did that um, in the Harper case when uh, it overruled uh, you know, laws that required people to pay poll taxes in order to vote. We recognized that the intersection, that that class one was a factor and wealth was a factor. Of course, it was against the backdrop of, of an intersection with race as well. The court had an opportunity there to continue to develop the 14th Amendment in that vein, uh, but, but did not and has repeatedly um, you know, looked askance at claims that assert uh, inequality based on wealth. Um, I think it's gonna be increasingly hard to elide that question when we have such an enormous uh, gap in wealth and, and enormous issues around income inequality, uh, a lot of them centered on race and gender. Um, and the court could do a lot to expand its theory of what is what it means to have equal opportunity and equal citizenship in a society, uh, what it means not to be bound by the circumstances in which you are born, what it means to have uh, equal access and promise to everything that this country offers. Um, I think the court can, can safely and soundly within the, the actual text for, for um, those who, who, who wanna limit uh, interpretation strictly to the text, even within the interpretation of equal protection under the law, and looking at due process issues, and and uh, the the uh, you know on the face of the Fourteenth Amendment, we can support an expansion to include wealth and class. Garrett, do you want to? Well, I just say, real quickly, that if you if you try to be a Fourteenth Amendment originalist. Uh, and really take seriously the thought of the people who put the 14th Amendment together, then class issues become actually quite present. Uh, because one of the, uh, I mean, Thaddeus Stevens, the framer, uh, the, you know, the, the, the sort of chief sponsor, uh, says in his final remarks, you know, that, 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 uh, that the old Constitution gave to moneyed wealth the power to tyrannize over labor. Uh, 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 and uh, William P. Fessenden, the Senate Spencer's, uh, sponsor, said his objection to slavery was that it created privileges of an oligarchical character, uh, that, that they were very concerned with the disparity of wealth. It doesn't, that doesn't produce a, dis, uh, a determinate result uh, for any case, but it does mean that when the court says, well, you know, the 14th Amendment has nothing to do with whether rich school districts and poor school districts should be equalized, that's wrong. That's, that is flat wrong as a matter of history, uh, and I think needs to be looked at very closely. Can I switch to my originalist hat for a minute? Sure. Switching to my originalist hat, there was a conscious decision to change the wording of the, 14th, of the equal protection part of the 14th Amendment from equal protection of life, liberty, and property to equal protection of the laws. Protection of the laws was a discrete right that narrowly about the protection, as some people in the earlier panel talked about, 
protection of people from violence and having to do with not having unequal, uh, not having unequal sentences, apparently, from what I read. But there is no indication that, it, that the equal, they, as I said, they, it was deliberately made to narrow the scope of the Equal Protection Clause. That's the only possible interpretation from that, because the earlier version drew a lot of Republican uh, uh, dissent from it. So I, I don't, I, I, uh, I know Garrett has read the uh, history, the legislative history of the 14th Amendment closely, but as I read it, I don't see anything in the legislative history that suggests that it was designed or thought or understood or originally meant or original methods to, to have the kind of equal educational funding that he describes. Mm -hmm. Randy and then uh, yeah. I'm not sure, I, I know, I don't agree with Jared about the policies that he's talking about, or whether they're constitutionally mandated policies, but um, I have to add that even if you give the Equal Protection Clause that uh, narrow and original meaning, which I think is plausible, it's quite plausible, that it's about, the, it's about the affirmative duty to protect, which is something that the Supreme Court has also said is not enforceable, that the, the government has a duty of protection, uh, and that's all it was about, primarily enforcing the law equally, the other provisions of the, of the 14th Amendment had non-discrimination aspects to them. The Privileges or Immunities Clause, you could violate the Privilege or Immunities Clause by denying everybody a privilege or immunity of citizenship or by denying some people a privilege or immunity of citizenship that other people enjoy. That's a non-discrimination clause. The Due Process of Law Clause, which ought to be called the Due Process of Law Clause, not the Due Process Clause, because it requires not only a judicial process, which is really what due process is about, but also that that judicial pro that nobody can be deprived of life, liberty, or property except by law, by a valid law. Um, what makes a law valid or not? This is something that would take more time than we have, and I have a different article coming out about that, about no arbitrary laws. Um, but it is not a valid law. Uh, if it treats citizens arbitrarily, um, as I think the law in Illinois did with respect to women practicing law. Um, so that would violate the due process of law if in fact someone is being arbitrarily deprived of life, liberty, or property by a statute or what John Marshall referred to as an act, um, uh, which is not necessarily a law unless it is something of a, so unless it's an equal or general law. So there is therefore even under the narrow reading of the Equal Protection Clause, a non-discrimination aspect to the first two clauses that has been underappreciated. Um, and again, this is another example of how by taking the Privilege or Immunities Clause out of the text, you then have led courts to expand the Due Process Clause to occupy some of that space, perhaps beyond where it should have gone, and expand the Equal Protection Clause beyond its proper original space to make up for the loss of a provision that if you came down from Mars and somebody said, you know in that Constitution, it says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. If you came down from Mars, you'd say, that sounds like a very important thing. That sounds like a very important part of your Constitution there. And then you'd have to explain to them, yeah, but in 1873, and then in the Crookshank case right after that, the court pretty much said, we're not going to listen to that one. We're, we're going to take that one out of the Constitution. That was a pretty big mistake. So I say something very similar to that uh, to my, my students about if you came down from Mars and looked at the Privileges and Immunities Clause. But I'm going to stick to my position as the traditional list on the panel with respect, or one of many maybe, um, and maybe that's to say uh, the, one, the one point I think we have to acknowledge and. Um, it is that uh, while originalism is a darling of the professorate, right, we've heard that term used, uh, that um, where we are right now as a matter of law is that the court doesn't do that, that that is um, not how the court says we interpret the Constitution. Um, so while it's very persuasive, I think, in, um, in, a, in a theoretical context to say, well, this is what the original meaning was or this is what um, history um, tells us about that provision, um, the way the court, as currently constituted, uh, says we understand the law is what a five court majority uh, has interpreted the law to mean and, um, and what binding precedent is. Um, now, I'll put a footnote on a footnote because I'm in the professor at myself, um, which is to say, sure, the composition of the court may change. And if there are five justices who adopt an originalist approach to interpreting the Constitution, um, which may very well happen in um, even my lifetime, uh, 
law as we know it, constitutional law as we know it, will change tremendously. Uh, so that's the, the overarching um, background. But as a court that develops its law and its precedent uh, through common law, um, th through common law adjudication, through precedent, um, there is nothing limiting the court to its current interpretation. And so um, I would echo Janae's point and just point to uh, there are um, numerous cases that um, if the court had decided San Antonio versus Rodriguez in favor of the plaintiffs and had held that um, socioeconomic status was also a way a law could classify that would trigger heightened scrutiny, we could tell a very coherent and cogent story in our constitutional law classes. It would be one that would read much like, and I tell my students, it could read much like the road to Brown versus Board and the road to heightened scrutiny for gender, that there are cases like Zablocki versus Red Hill and a number of cases that were filed by civil rights impact lawyers, some of whom worked at the LDF, that were trying to get that exact outcome. So for whomever asked the question, um, it's absolutely not a foregone conclusion that we've ended where we have with respect to the court's interpretation. And that may very well be the point, and many of the originalists would critique the court's approach for that reason, uh, that um, it gives them lots of discretion. And But I would say, as the law is currently constituted, with the current membership, and I realize it is one that is contingent on Justice Kennedy at this point, that um, there's nothing that would stop the court uh, from um, including protection on the basis of socioeconomic status. Now, will it, which is what Janae was tempted to, to answer, um, you know, I'm, I'm really um, uh, never the one to use a crystal ball, um, except when I'm as certain as I am. I mean, I don't see that happening very, very, very soon, but I, I definitely think it could be under the court's current interpretation. Can I add a footnote to just something Kimberly just said? Because Kimberly used a reference uh, called, the, she said, the darling of the professoriate. Um, I just want to tell everybody where that comes from. That comes from a question uh, or a caustic remark made by Justice Scalia. Uh, in the McDonald case, which was the right to keep and bear arms case as to whether the 14th Amendment would protect the individual right to keep and bear arms. And Alan Gura, Georgetown Law graduate, uh, was arguing on behalf of, uh, of Mr. McDonald um, that the right of the keep and bear arms really should be protected by the Privileges or Immunities Clause uh, because that actually is one of the core rights that we know expressly was meant to be protected by the Privileges or Immunities Clause. If we, in fact, we have more evidence on that than almost any other right because the Republicans were very concerned that African Americans would be able to protect themselves from mob violence and also from militia violence. Um, when Allen was making that argument about the Privileges or Immunities Clause, Justice Scalia said, well, um, we know that's the darling of the professoriate. Or what, he, or what he said is, are you bucking for a job on a law school faculty uh, by making this argument? Which I actually thought, and I admired Justice Scalia a lot, um, and I certainly admired his tenacity uh, when he defended originalism, but I thought this was actually a pretty shocking statement coming from him because he was ultimately disparaging, not just criticizing, but disparaging the reliant, uh, reliance on the original meaning of the text of the Constitution. Uh, and then, he then, in, in defense of a traditionalist approach, which said, look, can't we get there by means of our existing doctrine, like the Due Process Clause doctrine? And I think the reason why he would prefer to get there that way is because it was a lot less threatening to other things. And so it was safer for him to stick with due process. And that's ultimately what four justices in the plurality opinion did in McDonald. They expanded the Due Process Clause to protect the right and keep our, uh, keep our arms. Only Justice Thomas was prepared and remains prepared to revive the uh, Privileges or Immunities Clause as a source of rights, and he wrote us a, a separate concurring in the judgment opinion, um, uh, which uh, is the swing vote in that case. It was so, a, privilege, a Privileges or Immunities Clause opinion was the swing vote in that case. So a note on a note, which is why I tell my students that um, Justice Scalia would be much more inclined to follow stare decisis, to follow precedent, um, and he's actually the source of that would support my point uh, that while we can talk about originalism theoretically now, as of this particular moment, um, it's not uh, the court's um, the, the court's majority approach to interpreting the Constitution. Can I, can I say something really quick about originalism that I think is really important? There is a difference between originalism as a field of study that you believe illuminates the correct results of cases and should be considered by courts and lawyers and originalism as a claim for a judicial method that this will produce determinate results. 
In, in my judgment, the latter claim that a judge can sit down and say, and this is Justice Thomas's claim in a lot of areas, I can sit down and decide this case by looking up the original intent or the original public meaning, as he would say. Uh, that claim is incoherent. That's just, that's simply indefensible. But to say that serious research and serious scholarship and the darlings of the professoriate uh, can produce illuminating information that is important to judges as they proceed in their common law uh, judging, I think that's quite powerfully true. And I'm, I'm delighted to be a kind of heretical member of that, of that particular movement. Um, well, unfortunately, we're already out of time for this panel, um, but I was going to close with just a general question, so you can feel free to um, jump in and add on to anything you've already said. But um, uh, so, we're, so we've talked a lot about where the court's <coughs> gone wrong and some areas where the court's gone right. And so where do you see, uh, what do you see the future of the 14th Amendment jurisprudence looking like? What, I what areas of law do you hope that the court may revisit in the future? Uh, and what areas do you think that hold maybe perhaps promise or uh, that you hope to see uh, fleshed out a little bit more? Maybe, Randy, starting with you. <laughs> um, all right, well, there's lots, uh, but we have limited time. So let me just start where I, uh, end where I started when I was mentioning um, uh, the fact that the 14th Amendment protected the right to pursue a lawful occupation. Uh, in general, I think the 14th Amendment does protect what's come to be called economic liberty um, uh, as, a, as, as distinct from personal liberty. I think it protects both personal and economic liberty as well. And I would like to see it move in that direction. And the way I would like to see it do that is by um, essentially making rationality review a real thing again. It was, it was uh, prior to Williamson v. Lee Optical, a case that was decided by the court in 1955. Even in the Caroline Products case, which is a very famous case, the court in the body of that case said that, in fact, uh, litigants ought to be able to challenge the rationality of laws as applied to them. Why? To prevent the enforcement of arbitrary laws. If you were to have that sort of review, not necessarily to supplant even more heightened scrutiny, I'm not saying it has to be the only form of review, but if you were to have that sort of heightened review of restrictions on individual liberty, Regardless of whether they're economic or personal, a lot more people are going to get protected. A lot more people who are in the out groups and can't get legislation passed on their own behalf are having, going to have a shot at being protected than they are under the current conceivable basis review where all the government has to do is come up with an imaginary justification for its rule unless it's violating a fundamental right when the set of fundamental rights is very narrowly defined. So that's what I would like to see the court do. It's somewhat of a modest proposal. It would, I think, have pretty substantial uh, implications. Anyone else? Jeanette? Yeah, I would very much like to see the court um, revisit the way in which we prove racial discrimination and the elimination of, of the notion that disparate impact uh, under the 14th Amendment is not viable. Um, I think we see how the progress and uh, the, the, the remedies that are achievable in the statutory context, uh, and if there's a true pursuit of equality, of equal protection under laws, we have to have a more expansive view of how we prove racial discrimination. Uh, and even in terms of proving intent, we hear the notion of implicit bias being floated around you know, in, in almost every context now, we can't lose sight of the fact that there is still explicit bias, but to expand our notions of how we get to the end result of, of vast inequality, we need to consider both implicit and explicit bias and consider the contextual evidence of that. Uh, and the court, as I said, has a wonderful um, uh, record of ways in which to do that under the Voting Rights Act and in, you know, in Title VII and other statutory contexts, the Fair Housing Act that we're also celebrating this year, and it needs to uh, uh, reinvigorate that analysis under the 14th Amendment specifically. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to see the court take seriously what I think the overall meaning of the 14th Amendment is, and it is this. This country cannot be healthy. This country cannot survive and thrive unless we are a union of truly democratic states, which means that politics and society in the states needs to be open. Uh, there, there can't be partisan gerrymandering, racial vote suppression, felon, uh, felon disfranchisement, uh, constrictions on free expression in the states and somehow produce a healthy country. 
That's what went wrong with the Civil War, I think the framers thought. Uh, and I think it is very wrong in a lot of parts of this country now. I'd like to see the court uh, revisit uh, the civil rights uh, cases uh, and um, to, as I said, um, make uh, Justice Harlan's dissenting interpretation of the, the citizenship clause, uh, the majority opinion, uh, and, um, and also uh, revisit uh, its limitation on Congress's power to enforce uh, the Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. I think across the board uh, that would um, be a move that would force the court uh, to then have some coherent uh, theoretical framework for what um, it views to be equal protection. Um, so I think the, um, the, the auxiliary benefit of that would ultimately be uh, the court um, and, and the originalist even amongst those on the court um, having to face uh, the, um, the original um, meaning, the original intent, all of those things of the citizenship clause as well as the equal protection clause uh, because I think uh, we are down um, an Alice in Wonderland sort of um, reality or lack of reality um, with uh, how the court is currently interpreting the equal protection clause, and if we're going to have a majority of the court that rejects uh, the idea of protecting discrete and insular minorities, um, a majority of the court that seems interested in protecting religious majorities, um, racial majorities, sexual orientation majorities, uh, then I think the Supreme Court um, owes us some coherent theoretical foundation for that kind of jurisprudence. I have just two quick things. I agree 100% about Section 5. I think that fits in with my vision. But something that Garrett said, if there is actually one thing that is clearer than voting right, or gun rights under the uh, Privileges or Immunities Clause, it, is, it was stated by the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, which reported the 14th Amendment to Congress, that this amendment has nothing to do with voting rights. They explicitly said that this doesn't confer the right to vote on anybody. So I think Garrett's view, you know, if you're looking at original meaning in any meaning, and there's a lot of uh, contextual background to that as well. So if you're looking to original meaning, it doesn't have anything to do with political rights. You're going to have to get there through the 15th Amendment if you well, get there. Well, it's curious that, that the framers then used the term the, vote to right, the right to vote in Section 2 and imposed a penalty for for abridging right. they, they uh, maybe, said they, maybe, they they, put, maybe that doesn't mean anything. It means something to me. The, yes, it, it means exactly what it says. It says if anybody is not allowed to vote in those states, the, uh, the now, that should be enforced, that the, that, the, uh, that the representation of those states should be eliminated, should be uh, uh, reduced. reduced in reduced. Congress. But that's something very different. They took out a right to vote provision and they made an explicit decision to take out the right to vote provision. And with respect to felon disenfranchisement, they explicitly recognized that in section two. So, so I'm not. Well, well, we can continue to go yeah, on there. Can, they, but but my, point is, my point is yeah, if you're talking not, about original meaning, and original meaning, it doesn't have anything to do with the right to vote. They said so. My and only and point this, this is the future of the 14th Amendment <laughs> right here. You're, you're seeing it play out in real time. Well, I can't help but say this sure. demonstrates that originalism is not constraining, yeah, right? right? I mean, we're, well, we're seeing out live how right. much originalists disagree amongst themselves and why it's difficult for it to be uh, the, the theory that judges use to interpret. I, I, I really respect it as a theoretical exercise. I think there's a lot we gain. And I would, I, I tell my students again, there's no judge on the court who should ever say that they're not interested in um, a, the specific intent of the framers or this kind of originalism as history. But as a cogent way of um, limiting the, the, the Constitution and interpreting it consistently, I think it's just a challenge. And it shows that any way you interpret the Constitution, a lot of discretion to whoever's doing the interpreting. I mean, I, I know we're at the end. I've sat through a number of uh, knocks on originalism quietly, um, but I, <laughs> but I, I need, I, I, let me just say a few things on behalf of originalism. Uh, nobody who is an originalist uh, and who thinks that the original meaning ought to constrain where it's discoverable thinks that that means it just constrains or dictates the results in all cases. No originalist thinks that thing. Um, there is a difference between figuring out the meaning of the Constitution is and then putting that meaning into effect. And to put that meaning into effect is going to require a lot of choice. It's going to require the development of implementing doctrines that are more or less true to that original meaning, the spirit, as opposed to the letter. 
Um, and though there's going to be a lot of room for disagreement about that. So the debate really isn't about where originalists may disagree, then that shows that originalism doesn't constrain. It's about what do you do when everyone does agree about what the original meaning of the text is. At that point, are judges authorized to override what, they, what is the consensus view of what the original meaning of the text is. That is the claim that's made by non-originalists in defense of the so-called living constitution. In my view, the only living constitution is one that's actually followed. And one that's ignored or can be superseded by judges or anyone else is actually a dead constitution. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> thank you to each of the panelists. And uh, I wish we could I wish we could continue the debate, but hopefully we will ho host many more conversations along these lines in, in the future and throughout the next year. So thank you so much thank for coming. Thank you. Joining. <laughs>